woman awakes in the middle of the night to find her husband not in her bed. And um, she puts on her robe and, and heads out throughout the house to try and figure out where he's at. Um, as she heads downstairs, she, gets find, she finds him sitting in the kitchen just at the table and just appears really deep in thought, just kind of staring at the wall. And um, as she's just kind of watching him, she sees him kind of wipe some tears from his eye. And she steps in and says, what's, what's the matter, dear? And uh, why, why are you down here at this time of the night? The husband looks up from his drink and um, says, well, it's the 20th anniversary of our first date. She, she's like, just, what? I can't believe you remember. And she starts to tear up. And the husband continues, do you remember our first date? I was 18. You were only 16. Once again, the wife is just touched to tears, thinking about her husband being so caring and sensitive. Yes, I do, she replies. The husband pauses. He's just trying to gather his words. Do you remember when your father caught us in the back seat of my car? Yes, I remember, the wife said, lowering herself into the chair beside him. Do you remember when he shoved the shotgun in my face and said, either you marry my daughter or I will make sure you spend the next 20 years in prison? I remember that too, she replied softly. He sighed as he wiped another tear away. I would have gotten out today. Uh, so just as the, the unexpected twist in this story, life often presents us with moments that, that catch us off guard, things that are a little bit beyond us or the way we thought life was going to go. And these moments evoke just all sorts of different emotions in our lives, from awe and wonder to confusion and curiosity. And today we're going to explore how those emotions can guide us closer to God. And um, we're talking about the places we go when it's beyond us. We're in our series, Atlas of the Heart, as uh, Mason was saying, and uh, the goal with this series is for us to be able to pinpoint our emotions, to be able to understand what we're feeling and why, and know then what to do with them. What is the, the, the message these emotions are trying to tell us? Why did God give us this ability to feel this way? And so that way we can know how to interact with it, and therefore lead us to the life that God has called us to. Now, I grew up loving cars. Um, my dad was not like a really huge car guy, but he enjoyed them, and it was something we could appreciate together. Um, but I really just loved cars. I liked the, the idea of going fast, and, and especially the really cool cars. But um, I, I remember even as a kid, as we're driving across town or on a, a road trip or something, I would quiz myself at night by like the headlight shapes and the taillight shapes of the cars in front of us and around us. You know, this is before we had technology to distract us in the car. Um, so I had to find games of my own, but I really enjoy cars. I've even built a few of my own um, from lifted vehicles to um, like big turbo fast cars. And anyways, it, it was a big deal to me when my son Asher started showing an interest in cars. Now, I had to shape him to, to really understand what, like, cool cars were. Um, originally, he was just like, that car is blue, and that car is cool. And I'm like, that is a Ford Taurus, and that is not cool. Um, right? And so I had to help him that. And we, we were doing pretty good. Um, just, just this last week, um, they had, we, we walked um, past a place that was like, you can rent exotic cars and drive them. And so he was like, whoa, a Lambo. That's so cool. And I was like, yeah, that's right. But... Recently, one of his favorite cars has become the Tesla Cybertruck. Um, I'm, I'm barely sure if it qualifies as a car or one of those like old steel trash cans with the spinny lids up top. Um, I saw another thing that said it, it's really, it looks like a child's first drawing of a car. And that might be why Asher likes it. He might like, I designed this and they made it. Um, I don't really know, but he thinks they're so cool. And when we came across the first one that we ever saw in person, we both just stood there filled with awe and wonder of it. Now, both awe and wonder are emotions we experience when something is beyond us. It feels like what we're witnessing can't really be true. Like we're seeing something that doesn't fit with how we move through life or how we want to understand our everyday lives. Now, that to me describes the first time I saw a Cybertruck. What the heck is this thing? Uh, but, but there's a difference between awe and wonder. We like to use those words um, interchangeably, and they're similar enough that Honestly, you can, but there is a difference, and I want to talk about that, right? All wishes, or inspires the wish to let shine, right? To, to let it just 
be in its glory and to sit back and participate that, to acknowledge and to unite. Because when we feel all, we want to simply stand back, but we also want other people to come in and experience that with us. When we see something that leaves us in awe, we want to invite other people to share in its glory. Now, wonder is similar that we, we see something that's vast and beyond us, but we wish to understand it, not just enjoy it. We want to figure it out. It fuels our passion um, for exploration and learning. It, it, it builds curiosity and the adventure. And so these, these differing things help you understand where your you are here arrow is pointed at, whether you're feeling awe or you're feeling wonder. I realized that Asher and I had similar but different experiences when seeing the Cybertruck for the first time. Asher had awe. He was speechless. He just wanted to, to let that child's drawing come to life and shine in all of its glory, right, and bask in it with me. He's just like, wow, it's so cool. I'm here with my dad looking at a cyber truck. Um, I had wonder, right, and it was inspiring me to understand, what the heck is this? Um, why? And why God? Why? No, uh, but there's a difference, right? And so in the Bible, there's a story about a man named Ezekiel. He was a prophet in the Old Testament, which means he was someone who was chosen by God to deliver messages to the people. And one day, Ezekiel had this extraordinary vision that left him in awe and wonder. Ezekiel 1.1, it says, On July 31st of my 30th year, while I was with the Judean exiles beside the Kabar River in Babylon, the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. Right, so this helps us set the stage of what's going on at, uh, Ezekiel's out and he's with some exiles and he's out alongside a river. He was 30 years old. Um, we often think of all the Bible heroes, you know, it's kind of old and gray and bearded with a staff and a cloak. But he was, he was a young man um, when this happened to him. And he saw visions of God, it says. Now the chapter continues in verse 3 of him trying to use human words to explain this thing that's so beyond him. All right, and so I'm going to read from there, but the, the words are not on the screen because I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to try and picture what Ezekiel is trying to describe to us. All right, so everybody close your eyes. Verse 3 says, As I looked, I saw a great storm coming from the north, driving before it a huge cloud that flashed with lightning and shone with brilliant light. There was fire inside the cloud, and in the middle of the fire glowed something like gleaming amber. From the center of the cloud came four living beings that looked human, except that each had four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight, and their feet had hooves like those of a calf and shone like burnished bronze. Under each of their four wings, I could see human hands. So each of the four beings had four faces and four wings. The wings of each living being touched the wings of the beings beside it. Each one moved straight forward in any direction without turning around. Each had a human face on the front, the face of a lion on the right side, the face of an ox on the left side, and the face of an eagle at the back. Each had two pairs of outstretched wings. One pair stretched out to touch the wings of the living beings on either side, and the other pair covered its body. They went in whatever direction the spirit chose, and they moved straight forward in any direction without turning around. The living beings looked like bright coals of fire or brilliant torches, and lightning seemed to flash back and forth among them. And the living beings darted to and fro like flashes of lightning. As I looked at these beings, I saw four wheels touching the ground beside them, one wheel belonging to each. The wheels sparkled as if made with beryl. All four wheels looked alike and were made the same. Each wheel had a second wheel turning crosswise within it. And the beings could move in any of the four directions they faced without turning as they moved. And the rims of the four wheels were tall and frightening, and they, co they were covered with eyes all around. When the living beings moved, the wheels moved with them, and they flew upward, and the wheels went up too. The, human, the spirit of the living beings was in the wheels, so wherever the spirit went, the wheels and the living beings also went. And when the beings moved and the wheels moved, then the beings stopped and the wheels stopped. And when the beings flew upward, the wheels rose up, and when the spirit of the living beings was in the wheels." Spread out, above, spread out above them was a surface like the sky, glittering like crystal. Beneath the surface of the wings, each living being stretched out to touch the other's wings and even had two wings covering its body. As they flew, their wings sounded to me like waves crashing against the shore or like the voice of the Almighty or like the shouting of a mighty army. And when they stopped, they let down their wings 
As they stood with wings lowered, a voice spoke from beyond the crystal surface above them. Above this surface was something that looked like a throne made of blue lapis lazuli. And on this throne, high above, was a figure whose appearance resembled a man. From what appeared to be his waist depth, he looked like gleaming amber, flickering like a fire. And from his waist down, he looked like a burning flame, shining with splendor. And all around him was a glowing halo, like a rainbow, shining in the clouds on a rainy day. This is what the glory of the Lord looked like to me. And when I saw it, I fell face down on the ground, and I heard someone's voice speaking to me. So at this point, God speaks to Ezekiel. He shares with him the plans of what he is supposed to speak to his people. And then chapter 3, so this takes multiple chapters. Chapter 3, verse 15, it says this. Then I came to the colony of Judean exiles in Tel Aviv, beside the Kabar River, and I was overwhelmed and sat among them for seven days. Now, could you guys even begin to, like, use your imagination and picture what Ezekiel is trying to describe there? Like, I, I literally, like, I read through it, and I just feel like, this is all mumbo-jumbo. I don't know what I'm saying, and there's wheels and eyes and wings and faces and feet and arms and things, and, and like a rainbow and like this jewel and like that thing, because what Ezekiel saw was something that was so beyond him it says that he used the words that he best could describe like it was. That means everything he saw was really not even that. It was something beyond him. It was left him without words. Now, the NLT uses that word that he was overwhelmed. And we talked about a few weeks ago um, what overwhelmed was, and that's not really what he was feeling here. Um, when we look at the Hebrew word of shamim, it translates to astonished, wondered, and amazed. If you saw something that you couldn't even put into words, and the best words you could use really left people more confused, that is something very beyond him. And I love that what happened is that he was so astonished and he was so in wonder that he sat by the river for seven days trying to understand what he saw, trying to comprehend what he had just experienced. Now, this leaves me with wonder. Did he eat? Did he go to the bathroom? Seven days is a long time to just sit there. Now, that was supposed to be funny. All right. But um, could you imagine experiencing something like that? Some moment of God. And maybe you have experienced it in small moments where God does something in your life and you're speechless. And it's hard to even describe the, the change that has happened in you or the things that, that God has done for you to other people because it leaves you there in awe. Now, wonder and awe are usually held for things much grander than cyber trucks, right? Things like nature, art, music, spiritual experiences or ideas. Moments of, of feeling overwhelmed, not by things that are out of our control that we desire to control, but being overwhelmed by things that are bigger than us that we understand we have no control over, right? Things like staring out into the ocean. Right, listening to the crashing waves and, and feeling the power of the ocean, realizing, wow, that's so much bigger than me. Or maybe you've ever been so far outside of the city that you stare up at the night sky and you see nearly an infinite number of stars and you begin to realize how small you are. Or even watching the flight path of a little butterfly through your backyard and imagining what life must look like for this butterfly Maybe it's the wonder or awe you experience as you watch your children take their first steps, right, or start their first job or even head off to college. To me, wonder and awe are things that are supposed to point us to God because God is awful. Right, that, that didn't come out right. Uh, like, like everything that he, he, he does is deserving of awe, right? We, we, call, we talk about God as being awesome. Now, to me, that's a weird word, word right? Um, he only has some awe. No, he has all of the awe. That's why he's awful, okay? Um, man, the, the, everything God does should lead us to want to step out of the way and just let him shine, but invite people in to see it happening as well. Right? The, the, God should leave us in multiple moments of our lives where we could only do one response, and that would be to just sit still overwhelmed by how vast and how great God is. 
And if you haven't had moments like that in your life because of God, you have not encountered the God that we truly serve because he is so beyond all of our ways and all of our things that, that when we encounter him, it should leave us in awe and wonder to, to just be able to sit back and just be overwhelmed by how great he is. As Christians, these moments should lead us to gratitude and lead us to worship. Do you know that the moments that you experience awe and wonder, God put that feeling inside of us, of all humans, so that they would come to experience him. Right? Psalm 19, 1 4 says, The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they make him known. They speak without a sound or a word. Their voice is never heard, yet their message has gone throughout the earth and their words to all of the world. Did you know that God created the beautiful things of this world? All of those moments of awe and wonder to help you see his glory so that people can look up to the sky and watch a sunset and be like, there's something beyond me that exists. And they're experiencing the glory of God. And when we experience moments of awe and wonder, whether it comes from watching our child take their first steps or the butterfly or the ocean or the mountains or the stars or any of those things that that take our breath away for a moment should lead us to worship God, to give him the glory that he deserves because that's what he was placed there for in the first place. So take a time, take moments when you see or you are here arrow pointed at awe and wonder to thank God for that time that he created all of that moment for you to experience his glory. Now, another experience that is beyond us can leave us feeling confusion. Now, confusion and wonder can be similar in experience, right? They both are an experience that leaves us with um, needing understanding. As wonder says, this is, this is so vast and so grand and beyond me that I want to understand it. Confusion, though, is more about This experience that that I am involved in right now, that I'm hearing, that I'm feeling, that I'm seeing, I'm experiencing, does not line up with prior beliefs or understanding, right? It's not associated with grand things, but but more with things we thought we had an understanding of, and all of a sudden we, we have something that's countering that happening in our lives, right? The you are here arrow for confusion shows up when a current understanding or held belief is challenged by a new experience or understanding. And so what do we do in moments of confusion? Right, Because we're, we're feeling it for a reason and our, our, our emotions are trying to tell our brain that like, hey, you're confused and there's something I need you to do here. Research has concluded that confusion is good for us and is actually categorized as an emotion critical to gaining knowledge and learning. Confusion has the potential to motivate Right, to lead us to deeper learning and to trigger problem solving. I love that, that it says the potential. Because again, remember, emotions are just information. They don't lead us. They don't do anything to us. We have to take that information and then act appropriately upon that. Now, so, so when you're confused, it doesn't mean like, oh, I'm learning something right now. It's just I'm confused. But when you recognize you're confused, you can choose to say, Oh, what do I need to learn here? What inside of me is, is countering that belief that's leaving me in the state of confusion that maybe I need to reevaluate? Now, that doesn't sound like a big deal, but how often do we observe others, because obviously we don't do this, right? Dismissing information that challenges their ideas, right? In order to avoid confusion, they're like, I'd rather just not have confusion, so I'm going to avoid that thing that's, that's there because I don't want to be wrong. Right, so they avoid the new things, the confusion, instead of saying, hmm, maybe I do have something to learn here. Now, in my line of work, I'm, I'm constantly coming up against confusion, whether that be in people's biblical beliefs or life situations, marriages, church decisions, whatever the situation, hardly ever are the facts and the information given a problem. It's usually the person's desire to not be wrong or to accept that their previous held idea possibly needs to change. Right? And I'll, I'm going to talk about my own struggle about this. I'm not saying like, oh, I'm so high and mighty above all of you guys. I see you struggle, but I don't. Um, right? that, that's not me at all. But I run into this often right? when I'm meeting with couples and, and 
you know, the, often the problem is that they both just have, the, the facts are the same and they're very real. It's that the confusion that it, it builds up, nobody wants to acknowledge that they might be wrong. And so they just try to avoid it, but that doesn't lead them anywhere. So in my experience, and probably yours, it's pretty rare for someone to be confused and then stop to think, engage in careful deliberation, revise their old thinking without having a fight. Right Throughout his time teaching and healing people, Jesus often encountered resistance from people who were confused, especially by his new teachings. He was trying to shift the mindset of an entire people group, right? That the rules of Judaism that, that they had grown up in were not bad in and of themselves, but they weren't the purpose for living, that, that those rules and laws had become everything that they did, but they were missing the point that, that was underneath of them, right? And that these laws were not going to save them. Jesus was trying to teach them it's about loving God, and it's about loving others as yourself, not just about doing the things. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus, this is Jesus' first speech addressing crowds of people, and he's trying to clear confusion for them. And so he, he's taking their old beliefs and their old thinking and trying to help them adjust to the new things. And we find this uh, sermon in Matthew 5, chapter 5 through chapter 7. But in Matthew 5, he's, he says, Don't un- misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. Right? I'm not saying that they don't matter. Right? It's not throw everything out and just le- listen to this new thing. He said, no, I came to accomplish their purpose. Right? He's trying to help them see where the confusion is. And, and so often when we're confused, we just want to feel like, oh, we got to throw out everything that we held before. But often it's not. Often it's just we need to, to make some adjustments and, and bring it into what's really going on. Right? And so Jesus goes on through Matthew 5 to state their old thinking and then starts to clarify what the new thinking should be. Verse 21, he says, You have heard that our ancestors were told, You must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. But I say, right? And then verse 27, You have heard that commandment that says, You must not commit adultery. But I say, verse 31, You have heard the law that says, A man can divorce his wife by merely giving her a written notice of divorce. But I say, 33, You have also heard our ancestors were told, You must not break your vows. You must carry out the vows you make to the Lord. But I say, verse 38, you have heard the law that says the punishment must must match the injury, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say, in verse 43, you've heard the law that says love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, he's trying to clarify confusion in them that, that they have a held belief that is, is not allowing them to move into what Jesus is trying to teach them. And he's sitting there trying to, to clarify to them, hey, that's great that you're holding that. We're not saying throw it out. But understand, this is the way we're supposed to be looking at it. Now, the problem was people could choose to use the confusion to learn, or they could choose to just hold on to what they already had before. And so then we find the religious elite at that time, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, and the temple assistants. These were the, the spiritual leaders of Judaism at the time. And uh, they didn't want to understand something new. They were often confused. It says they're always trying to trap Jesus. They're asking all these questions. You could tell that they, they didn't understand what he was saying, but they didn't want to understand. They chose to allow the confusion to you know, be something they wanted to avoid. And now they get a really bad rap, right? Sure, they schemed to kill Jesus, and that's probably not nice, but they really just didn't want to deal with the confusion, right? And they wanted to hold their first beliefs. Now, it's really easy for us to judge them for not changing their beliefs when Jesus came to the scene, right? Because we look at it, we're reading this whole story, and we're like, come on, guys, don't you see that's Jesus? Like, what he's doing, what he's teaching you? But when was the last time one of your beliefs about faith was challenged? Did you let the confusion lead you to change? Or did you just wait for that feeling to go away so you could go back to your old life? Did you pursue it as an opportunity to learn more of what God may be calling you to? Or did you say, that sounds difficult. I don't don't need that right now. Right, in Matthew 13, 52, Jesus shares this kind of random little nugget of information as he's talking to his disciples. And it says, then he added, every teacher of religious law who becomes a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like a homeowner 
who brings from his storeroom new gems of truth as well as old. Like Jesus is telling to his disciples that some of these people who knew the law are going to come to be believers. And they're going to have to understand that there's old gems of truth and new gems of truth that will come in. Right? Jesus is trying to say that anyone who becomes a follower of Jesus is going to bring old beliefs and, and need to bring in new beliefs. And throughout your life, especially your, your life of faith, you should be coming across new to you truths. Things that challenge you and cause you to change. It's uncomfortable. It's hard. But did you know that when something is uncomfortable and hard and you're learning it, it means that what you're learning is going to be effective? When it's easy, when, it, when it's just happening and it doesn't seem to affect your life, it's really not going to change you and you probably really aren't learning anything from it. Studies show that effective learning needs to have effort. Comfortable learning rarely leads to deep learning. Right? And this is why at Generation Church, we don't shy away from doubt and from questioning. Right? I don't believe that you can mature into the Christian that God wants you to be without wrestling through doubt multiple times in your life. Deep doubt, not just surface level doubt. Right? If you haven't had a time in your life where you have doubted that God is real, if that's never happened to you, then I think you have some real maturing to do in your faith. Because most likely, if you don't have doubts ever, your faith is not something that takes faith. And so when your you are here arrow is pointed at confusion, lean into it. See what you need to learn, and especially when it has to do with your faith. Because let me tell you, I've been a, a, a Christian for a long time. I've been somebody who's been studying scripture and doing schooling and all sorts of things for a long time. And there's hardly ever a week that goes by where I don't read something that I'm like, huh, that's, that's confusing. Right? And if you can read your Bible and you're never confused by it, well, first of all, you're just lying, or you don't read your Bible. Uh, right? Because there's many things in there that, that we don't understand, and it should cause us to dig deeper. Some other similar emotions we can experience when things are beyond us are curiosity and interest. These are both important parts um, of our need for making meaning in our life. And uh, some research shows that curiosity and interest are actually very much the same but there's a difference in how we communicate them. We say things like, I want my kids to be curious and to show interest. Or maybe you're look, hiring someone and you're like, I'm looking for an employee who is curious but demonstrates interest in our work. You may say, I value curiosity in a person. Or you may say things like, that person shows interest in this topic. Curiosity seems to involve both feeling, right, the emotions of something, and the thinking, the cognition side of us. Um, interest just tends to be our thinking part. We, we don't get deeply involved to things that just catch our interest. Now, curiosity is recognizing a gap in our knowledge about something that interests us, and then becoming emotionally and cognitively invested in closing that gap through ex exploration and learning. There are differences in our heart and our head investment between curiosity and interest. Right? With interest, our mind is open to seeing what's out there. But with curiosity, we've acknowledged that, oh, I don't know something and I need to understand. I need to know it. And our heart and our head are, are both invested now. For me, the difference is usually, how do I feel if I can't get the answer? Interest holds my attention as long as the info's there. Right? I could be watching a TV show that cuts off halfway through, and if I don't care to know how it ends, I was just interested. But curiosity is that, that desire that, that you can't stop until that interest is resolved. Right? A TV show ends, but you have to know what happens next. It's what leads us to binge watch everything. Right? Something piques your interest, and you can't stop thinking about it until you have all the answers. Um, I'd say most of us in here grew up or lived before the internet was so accessible. Right? Would you say, like, I didn't, you didn't have internet in your pocket um, for your whole life? And I honestly, at this point of my life now, don't know how I functioned before that. I'm constantly searching up things that, that piqued my curiosity, right? You know, you see someone in a TV show, and you're like, they were in something I've seen before. And so then I have to Google. I can't stop thinking. I can barely pay attention to the show until I can resolve what's going on. Or, you know, or somebody's talking, and you're like, oh, that reminds me of something that I read somewhere, and I, I have to search it out and find it. Um, before the Internet was accessible, like, I had to wait till I got home to my encyclopedias, 
And, uh, and then beyond that, I had to hope that whatever it was I needed to know existed before the really old set of encyclopedias I had. There, I remember times as a kid, like, opening up my encyclopedia and just didn't exist yet. So it was just, like, was it in there? You're like, oh, I guess I'll just never know. And um, to this day, I still feel emptiness. No, uh, but what actually happened is, is you would go and ask the smartest person that you knew, whether that was your parents or an uncle or a friend, um, and you would just have to be okay with that answer. Could you imagine that kind of life you live now, you know? Somebody just tells you, well, that's how it is. You know, and that's why people believe weird things, to be honest, um, because someone just said it, and that was the best we had at the time. Um, there was no fact-checking or looking into stuff. You just had to trust people. Do you guys remember Ask Cha-Cha? It was a texting service. Um, now, Ask Jesus is, is Google. Cha-Cha was different. Okay? You literally, it was like AI for phones before you had access. You could text the number for Cha-Cha and ask any question you wanted to ask. And um, from small things like, what's the weather right now in this zip code? Or what are the movie times at this theater? And it would respond back in a text form. But you could also ask it, what's the meaning of life? Uh, and you could do all, this, all of these random things. I actually worked for them on um, the, the dashboard receiving side of everybody's answers or questions going in. Um, I log into this dashboard that would just show you things that, that were filtered to you and of these people asking these questions. And for all of like the simple stuff, it kind of was able to search the web for you and pull up things. When they asked the weather, the zip code, it would pop up. And you could just copy and paste it in. But some of my, my favorite time was spent on the, the ones that didn't have answers for, like the meaning of life or what, what, how, what do you think about these random things? It was just always funny and, and weird, the questions that came in. And I honestly wish I would have recorded them. And um, like I said, you could pick the, the categories of the questions you wanted to handle. And um, now, most people didn't want the philosophical type ones because you got paid by how many you answered. So the easier ones, you got paid more. Um, but I, I was just so, I was curious about the curiosity peaked in all these random people and the questions that they would send in. And um, often they would just lead me down rabbit trails because they'd say something, so I'd start reading about it. And then, you know, like 14 hours later, I realized I've made no money, I've accomplished nothing, um, just like this story is doing for us. So anyways, um, the easiest way for me to understand curiosity and interest right, is that, that your you are here arrow is pointed at interest when something piques your attention, but you can move on without knowing the answer. Curiosity says you cannot move on until you know the answer. Now, the difference between confusion and curiosity is confusion is when something is contrasting to something that you already thought you knew. It conflicts with something that, that's already there, and a new information comes in that's fighting for that space. Curiosity is when you interact with something that says, oh, I don't know anything about that. I have a gap, and I need to fill that with information. Now, I'm a firm believer that we should be lifelong learners. Um, studies show that curiosity and knowledge building grow together. In other words, the, the more we know, the more we will want to know. Right? And we should be people that are, are students of life and really students of Scripture. And we, the more we dig in to learn, the more that, that it will inspire us to continue to learn. Um, it's one of the reasons why we offer Discover Ministry School and why we want you guys to sign up for it is because it should lead us to, to wanting more. And why not want more knowledge about God, right? Now, knowledge is not an end goal. It doesn't save us. It doesn't solve things for us. But, but it can inspire us to build a, a relationship with God and find us in more moments of awe and wonder and things. Now, I buy too many books. I also want too many books. Um, you can ask Victoria. There's books that show up on a near weekly basis at our house as I keep finding more books I want to read. Um, I, I was blessed to grow up in a home that encouraged reading. Both my parents enjoyed reading, and as far back as I can remember in my childhood, I spent every evening reading um, before bed. It was one of our nighttime rituals. We all went to our bedrooms, and we'd read. And many times I remember being told I needed to stop reading and go to sleep, and I would just wait and then read um, or hide under my sheets and keep reading. Like right now, I'm currently reading like five books or so and have stacks of books around my house and a, a library worth on my Amazon wish list. And even as I was writing this message, I ordered two more books. Uh, and, and I don't say this to brag, but to say that, that I've come to a realization that there's so much more out there for me to learn. 
right? And what it's done is it brings humility and, and many other things into my, my life that allows me to be able to find growth more often. I learned years ago to hold on to my beliefs loosely, right? Not, not that I just throw things out willy-nilly, like just whatever, I don't want this anymore. But to understand that I don't know everything, right? And that, that what I believe today can be changed tomorrow if information leads it, me to find confusion or if gaps start to appear that it's okay for me to search those things out. And when I say beliefs, I'm not just talking about my faith beliefs, but my beliefs about marriage, about friendship, about raising children, about how I, I view life, how I schedule my day, to my beliefs about why my sports team is the best and why yours sucks. And uh, no, but, but my belief about the, the world we live in and um, from the smallest thing to the biggest thing, when we hold on to these things too tightly, we, we no longer learn, which means we're no longer able to grow. Right? And that's literally why what part of our purpose statement here is that we will grow in Christ. Because I don't believe that we should ever stop growing. If you're encountering the same God that I'm encountering, you should be changing and growing daily, if not multiple times a day. Right? And often what keeps us from that is we, we shut off curiosity. We don't allow that to come in and, and shape us and, and change us and cause us to reevaluate the things that we hold on to in our beliefs, right? I would say like a near weekly basis, if not more often, I'm challenged to change things in my life, whether through confusion or curiosity, right? And even more so in this series as I'm studying and reading on emotions and trying to bring information to you. Brene Brown and the, the, the author of Atlas of the Heart, the book we're using as a guide for the emotion part of this, says, choosing to be curious is choosing to be vulnerable because it requires us to surrender to uncertainty. We have to ask questions, admit to not knowing, risk being told that we shouldn't be asking, or sometimes make discoveries that lead to discomfort. You know, like kids, they ask a bajillion questions. I don't know, have you guys ever been around a kid that asks a lot of questions? Um, that was, I guarantee, was me growing up. Um, my kids, because I cursed that my children asked lots of questions. Um, but I believe that's more the way that we should approach life. Right now, you know, as we've grown, we realize when it's appropriate time to ask questions or, you know, things like that and uh, can find the right people. But as kids and as we grow, we often find out that, that people don't want to hear your questions. You're just supposed to just take what is said and believe it and, and just to move on. Or we, we open up to be curious and that makes us vulnerable, which leads to us being hurt. So then instead we choose to just have certainty versus curiosity or knowing over learning. But that shutting down like that comes with a price. And that means that you're not going to grow. Right? That price is being stuck in life as you are and not able to grow into a more fulfilled person. Usually spending most of your time defending your decision to not grow. And we've been taught that the opposite of doubt or unbelief is certainty. Right? But the, the reality is we lack the ability to understand the things of God. Yes, yeah, like God is so much greater than us that we will never fully understand God, why he does what he does, how he does things, and, and anything really about God. We can begin to understand some truths. We can see the patterns of the way he reacts. We can understand that he loves us unconditionally, but we don't even really grasp that because we don't have relationships in life that love unconditionally, right? And so we, even with that, we don't hold it to the standard that God does really love us the way that he does, right? And so we want to hold on to certainty, but when it comes to God, we don't really have anything certain like that to hold on to. The opposite of doubt and unbelief is not certainty. It's faith. It's trust. It's saying, I can believe enough that God is a loving father and therefore he's going to take care of me and that these things that, that leave me in, in curious and confused at times, that he's going to work out for me as I dig in and learn through them, that, that he's not afraid of my doubt because he understands I can't believe him, that I can't fully understand it. And it's okay to wrestle through those things. We probably all know people, I know it's not you, that, that know everything, right? Uh, they, they can't admit when they're wrong. 
They, they respond to everything with, I know, even when it's like the complete opposite of what you just, you know, they say something, you're like, no, it's actually this. And they're like, I know. And it's like, well, no, no. Um, I, I don't even know how to respond to that, right? Maybe they, these people tend to lean more defensive. Um, again, you, you probably know someone like it. Obviously not you. I get it. Um, right? I know. Um, now, I used to live my life as a know-it-all. Um, and, you know, I, I've been digging back through my past and trying to see the things that shaped me and made me the way that I am. And, you know, I can, I can have excuses for it. And part of the thing is that I just do know a lot. Um, and I know that sounds really prideful. I get that. Uh, I've, literally, I've been blessed by God to be someone who has a wonderful ability to learn and to retain information. Um, that is a gift that I have. I, you guys have gifts I don't have, and that's okay. Um, but what I found was that nobody really liked the know-it-all part of me. You know, as I grew up, um, I still get teased from my friends and my family from that knew me um, through high school and afterwards. But um, now a lot of this know-it-all, like, way I live my life um, was stemmed from insecurities I had as a child, right? That we grew up very poor. I didn't have things. I didn't have nice stuff. I, most of my clothes were handed me down for the majority of my life, honestly, and I always felt looked down upon. But the one thing people couldn't take from me or I could get on myself was knowledge. And so, I, like I said, I loved to read, to read and to learn. Um, I read through our encyclopedias and our stuff because I wanted to have something that was better than other people. Um, and so I... By the time I graduated high school, I graduated like top 10%. I could score really high on tests. And um, because of how God works things out, I didn't end up actually going off to um, a regular like four-year university or college. I had offers and many different things, but God had a different plan for me. Um, and I think that was because I needed to be humbled and realize my insecurities with my knowledge and all those things. But um, so by the time I graduated high school, I'd already finished my first year of Bible college and um, went off to a discipleship program where a bunch of people were new Christians or just becoming serious about their faith. And like when I was in high school, I was already running my church's youth um, Bible study that we had because the adult leader was like, he answers questions better than me and quit. And um, not, like, it was no lie. She would tell you to your face that that's what happened because she came and told me the same thing. And um, so I went off to this discipleship program and I was ahead of them in my knowledge about God. And I wasn't shy in showing that. And it, it really wasn't even bragging about it, but I wanted people to see it. Um, because to me, it was like, well, this is knowledge about God. How can it be wrong if, if it's good knowledge, right? It's, it's good things. I, I'm the one who, who knows the right things and I was the first one to answer questions, the first one to, to you know, show that I knew all the stuff. Now, there's a book in the New Testament um, of the Bible, and it's written by Paul. It's actually a letter to the church of the town in Corinth. And Paul helped establish this church. And whenever there was issues, he would write them letters. He'd find out, and he would send a letter to help provide some guidance. And this church was fighting about whether it was okay to eat food that someone offered to an idol. Um, it was different times back then. We don't really have that argument too often these days. Um, okay. Uh, maybe you guys do. I don't know. Um, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 8 about this issue, verse 1, he says, Now regarding your question about food that has been offered to idols, yes, we know, uh, we know that we all have knowledge about this issue. But while knowledge makes us feel important, it is love that strengthens the church. Anyone who claims to know all the answers doesn't really know very much. But the person who loves God is the one whom God recognizes. Paul was really clear to say it's great that you all have ideas. I get that you all know some things. That's cool. We all have ideas. But what would love do? And I was really, really convicted by this verse. And I made it my mission to not be seen as the one who knows things, but the one that loves people. Right? And that often involves swallowing my pride, letting people assume I don't know the things. And that was really, 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 really hard for me. And to this day, it's still something that's hard for me. Right? But I want to be seen not as the one who knows things, but the one who loves other people well. 
And I put that challenge out there that if, if you have a desire to prove to others that you know things, consider that, first off, it's pride. And it may have came from insecurities, may have came from all sorts of different things in life, but that's what it is. But secondly, that it really may be getting in the way of love that we need to strengthen our church or your family or the people around you. The longer that you stay in the certainty of I know things, the more your curiosity for life dulls. Because curiosity says, I don't know things and I need to find the answers. It takes humility. It takes the ability to admit you don't know and could be wrong. Researchers are actually finding that curiosity is correlated with creativity, intelligence, improved learning and memory and problem solving. And I believe curiosity is one of the things that's supposed to draw us to Jesus. Because if we understand Christianity correctly, the answer to underneath of all of life is God. When I worked for Ask Cha Cha, um, often people would really send in the message, the question, what is the meaning of life? It literally came in multiple times a day. And I had some really cool opportunities to talk to people about God at that very same time. And I believe that, that God has these treasures of knowledge about him and who he is hidden for us to find with our curiosity. Proverbs 25, 2 says, it is God's privilege to conceal things. It's his privilege to hide them. And it's the king's privilege, it's royalty's privilege to be able to discover them. And then when Jesus came, in Matthew 7, 7, he says, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. To me, that's like, stay curious and keep coming after me and you will find the things that you're looking for. Curiosity is a God-given emotion meant to lead us into deeper relationship with him. When you find your you are here arrow pointed at curiosity, let it lead you to new learning. Let it keep you humble. And even more so, let it lead you closer to Jesus. Now, there was this janitor who spent a large part of his life working at this same school, year after year, day after day, you know, cleaning and taking care of the same things. And over the years, he befriended many of the children and the faculty. And one day while he was in his janitor closet, he heard a group of familiar voices outside the door, the voices of one of his favorite classes that year. He decided that, you know, they must be getting water from the drinking fountain right outside the closet and decided to take advantage of, of the moment and share some excitement with him. And so he whipped open the door quickly, jumped out and said, unexpected. Seems unexpected. Wait, did you expect me to yell, supplies? Okay. Um, that's, that's good. Okay. The, this is exactly what I needed to happen. This is wonderful. The last emotions that we're briefly going to discuss this morning is that when we experience something that's beyond us is surprise and unexpectedness. Surprise is an interruption by information that doesn't fit with our current understanding or expectations. Right? We can think of surprise as being this bridge between cognition, our brain, and emotion. It's a very short bridge, uh, rarely lasts more than a few seconds. Nobody's like surprised for hours. Um, they also consider surprise to be this amplifier of emotions. Right? Once our thinking brain works out the unexpected thing that's happening, we move into emotion. Right? There's evidence that surprise amplifies those following emotions with more surprising events resulting in stronger emotional reactions. Say you knew you were having a birthday party. You know, it was, it was scheduled months in advance, you know, Saturday evening, 6 p.m., you knew that everyone was coming. You knew your, your friends were going to be there, your parents were flying in, your best friend from college was coming back to town for it, and you knew all that, and you, you walked in the door, and they started singing happy birthday to you. You would feel loved. You would feel cared for. It would be really nice. You, you may even tear up a little bit because um, you're just like, oh, it's so good to have everybody here. But you're happy that those people are celebrating with you. But now, consider the exact same party, except for you have no idea it's happening. Right? And you're going over to your friend's house because he invited you over to um, watch TV or something. And you open up the door and all those same people are there except for you didn't know any of them were going to be there. Your friend you haven't seen in years, your parents who live on the other side of, of the country flew in to be there at this surprise party. You're going to feel loved and cared for. 
but you're most likely going to start crying and be very overwhelmed by all that feeling. The exact same feeling amplified by surprise. The next thing I'm going to share with you may shock you, may make you guys kind of sick, may uh, disturb you that these people exist in this world. And I'm pretty sure some of them are in this room. Did you know that there are people who read the whole plot of TV shows, movies, and books before they watch them or experience them? Yeah, seriously queasy right now, just saying those things out loud. But you know what leads them to do that is they don't want to be surprised by it because they want to experience the emotions, but they don't want it to be amplified. Right? They don't want to be caught crying in the theater over something silly. They, they, they want to know that that's going to happen so they can feel moved, but not overwhelmed by some emotions, taken to a level that they didn't want to experience. And somehow this doesn't ruin the experience for them, and I just can't believe that. Um, now, Brene Brown happens to be one of those people, one of my favorite authors was, used to be. Um, no, I'm just kidding, but... but Right? So they don't, she doesn't want to experience that amplified version of those emotions, so she looks ahead of them so she's not surprised. Now, there's a, a strong relationship between the emotion of surprise and unexpectedness. The main difference between them is that at a surprise party, you don't yell unexpected. Um, yeah, not at least, not at least. Okay. Um, surprise is just a short bridge. It's usually, like I said, it catches us off guard, but then quickly allows us to move to our next emotion once our brain catches on to what's going on. Unexpectedness is a, is a longer bridge. Similar in the feeling of something has caught you completely off guard and your brain cannot cognitively catch up to what's happening and it leaves you feeling this emotion of un, like just open and vulnerable and, and, and leaves you there. But because it's a longer bridge, you know, um, it's something that, that you weren't expecting at all or things, we, we tend to feel unexpected when something is negative because we don't want to move to negative feelings as fast. Right? And so really they're very, very similar. Surprise, though, we tend to label for positive things and unexpected for things that we feel are more negative or that, that took longer for us to grasp. Um, think of the surprise that the Marys, the women that, that showed up at Jesus' tomb after he had rose from the dead, you know, think of the surprise that they felt only to not only find it empty, but then an angel to be there talking to them. In Matthew 28, 8 through 9, it shows their reaction. Jesus, you know, is, is rose from the dead. The, the, the tomb is empty when they get there to take care of his body. It's, he's not there. There's an angel that's like, hey, Jesus rose from the dead. Go tell the disciples. And it says, the women ran quickly from the tomb. They were very frightened, but also filled with great joy. And they rushed to give the disciples the angel's message. And as they went, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they ran to him and they grasped his feet and they worshiped him. Right? I mean, I can't imagine the, the amplified emotions, right? Like, because they're going to go tell the disciples, hey, this tomb is empty. And we find like doubting Thomas and people that are like experiencing an emotion there. Like, I, oh, I don't know if that's really true or, or how this is, but but because of the surprise for them element, it, it, it took them to very frightened and great joy. Not just frightened and joyful, very and great. And then they saw Jesus and they ran to him and grasped his feet and worshiped him. I believe that amplified feeling that we have when, when surprise happens is there to, to mark wonderful impacts in our life so that we remember them in greater detail. And as we close this morning, I want you to see that God has given us these emotions of things that, that are beyond us to help draw us nearer to him. Right? That awe and wonder and confusion and curiosity should, should bring us to places where we go, whoa, I want to understand what that is. Understanding that we may not be able to grasp it all, but, but it draws it in and even more so that we do it together. Right, that we're not alone in this, this walk of life and our curiosity, that we have each other in there, but that when we sit back in awe of God, that we would invite people to participate in it, that we would share the stories, that we would explain, try our best to explain what God is doing in our lives so that other people could be brought into it with us. 
that it would leave us wanting more of who he is, that we would accept that call to stay lifelong learners and that we may, maybe won't ever have everything figured out in life. And that's okay. And remember, it's okay to be surprised by God. I think it's something that daily we should be surprised. Man, I can't believe God met me this morning in my devotion time. I, I'm surprised that he still continues to love me after all of my failings and my wrongdoings. He still loves me. Right? And those should be wonderful marked experiences in our lives that keep us coming back to him. All right, so let's pray. God, I thank you for the, the opportunities uh, we have in life to be caught up in awe and wonder of the things that you do, God. That, that we, we really should go about life. God, help us to go about life, searching out those opportunities to um, see what you're doing for us, God. That when we look at the skies and the sunsets and the sun rises and the weather changes and the things that, that are so beyond us, God, that it would remind us to come to you with gratitude to give you the glory that you deserve, God, to share these things with the people around us. God, may we remain full of curiosity. God, in the, the, the moments that confusion happens, God, when we're reading your word or when we encounter teaching that, that contradicts things that, that we thought we knew and understood, God, that we would be open and willing to admit that maybe we're wrong and that we have more to learn, God. Keep us humble, keep us moldable so that we may grow in Christ. We come more into your likeness on this earth, Lord. God, may, may we be people that are willing to hear you say, I know you've heard all this, but I say this. God, as we're encountering your word, as we're encountering you, Lord. God, I pray that you would just help us overall to recognize the places that we are at in life Lord, and the, give us the, the right responses to them, Father. God, we love you so much. We're so grateful um, for the emotions that you've given us, Lord, to experience life and to lead us to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.